Today we are going to talk about the digestive system. And so the digestive system is just so important to your health. Okay? It's so important to your health. Um, this is how your body gets nutrients. This is how your body gets glucose. Okay? And so um, glucose we need to make ATP. And most of the processes in your body are going to require ATP, right? So um, we use the oxygen we breathe in, and we use the glucose that we eat or drink, and that's how we make ATP. When we get to chapter 25, we're going to talk about metabolism, and that's going to show us how we use the oxygen and how we use the glucose to make or glucose to make that ATP. But this is how do we get it into our bodies, right? So, um, very, very important system in the body for your health, okay? Basically, the digestive system is one big muscular tube. And so it starts in the oral cavity, which is kind of an expanded area of the muscular tube. And it moves down through this long tube called the esophagus. And then it moves into this expanded tube, which is called the stomach. And then it moves into this really long, 21 foot long tube called the small intestine. And then it moves into this um, large diameter tube called the colon or the large intestine, and then it moves into the rectum. Okay? And so what you're doing is you're ingesting things, you're ingesting fluids and you're ingesting food, and it comes in through the mouth. And now what we have to do is we have to take this, this um, material and we have to mechanically break it down into smaller pieces, and then we have to chemically break it down into small enough chemicals that can get absorbed into the body, okay? So think about what it has to get absorbed through. First, it has to get absorbed through the wall of that muscular tube. Then it's in the interstitial space. Then it has to get absorbed into, uh, through the blood vessel lining to get into the blood. Once it's in your blood, now we say it's absorbed, right? So we have to look at where are those chemicals coming from that help to break those materials down, um, and, and what is happening in each location of that tube, okay? So to begin with, um, we should first tell you the, the chemicals themselves. And so you guys know this anyway, but we, we have things that are called polysaccharides. These are some of the things that we, you know, eat. Polysaccharides are complex sugars, right? That's complex carbohydrates. So polysaccharides are carbohydrates. Right? And so those are going to get broken down into the smallest unit possible that can then be absorbed, and that is called a monosaccharide. A monosaccharide. And so the most common monosaccharide that our body uses for energy is glucose. Right? Now there's other monosaccharides. We've got, you know, we're gonna, I mean, there's... Um, other monosaccharides like fructose, but the main one that our body uses, most of our cells use, is glucose. Okay? All right, so we've got polysaccharides. And then we have things like um, proteins, and another name for proteins are polypeptides, right? Polypeptides. And polypeptides have to get broken down into their smallest unit, which is what? Amino acids. All right, so our body can absorb the amino acids. They're small enough to go through the wall of the, of the digestive tract and through the wall of the blood vessels to get into the blood, okay? So we can digest, we can absorb um, the monosaccharides and the amino acids. And then lastly, um, we have lipids, right? And lipids are going to be broken down into triglycerides. Right? And triglycerides then can be stored in the body in fat cells, and we can pull those out and break those down even further into fatty acids and glycerol. And fatty acids and glycerol can be used to make energy. But the triglycerides are the ones that can be absorbed 
uh, into the digestive tract. So what we're looking at is, okay, we're eating these things. We're eating polysaccharides, proteins, and lipids. Then how does our digestive tract digest it chemically down into these um, substances? And then where are they getting absorbed? So where do we absorb them? Uh, into the, you know, through the digestive tract and into the blood. Where is that happening? Okay. Um, we also have to look at the enzymes that will break these down. And then where are those enzymes coming from? There's some, um, there's accessory structures in the digestive tract, like the salivary glands. They're going to secrete some things that will help with the breakdown of those molecules. The liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the cells of the intestinal um, tract, so the mucosal cells in the intestinal tract, uh, some cells in the stomach. They're going to secrete things to break these things down into their smallest units. So that's what we're basically doing today. We're going to talk about uh, all of those different um, things. So we'll start, um, first of all, by looking at some basic things in the um, digestive tract. You know, we, we've talked about this in other, um, let's see here, sorry about that, okay. We've talked about this in other um, units, but there's a serous membrane, right, that surrounds the um, different cavities. So we talked about the pleura and the pericardium. Um, now we're talking about a specific cavity um, that's going to house most of the digestive organs or all the digestive organs, uh, and that's called the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity, um, inside the peritoneal cavity are all of those structures of the, um, most of the structures of the digestive tract. There's some things that are going to be outside of that peritoneum, um, like the pancreas, um, the duodenum. There's some things that are outside of it. Um, but it has a serous, it has a um, parietal peritoneum, and that is the outermost layer of that membrane that just surrounds the entire peritoneal cavity, right? So you can see the uterus is outside of that, the urinary bladder is outside of that, the rectum is outside of that. So there's certain things that are outside of that peritoneal cavity, um, but the serous membrane the, that is the parietal um, peritoneum is on the outside. And then the visceral peritoneum surrounds all the little organs that are inside that, um, that cavity. So like the liver is surrounded by the visceral per uh, peritoneum. The stomach is surrounded by the visceral peritoneum. The, um, the colon is surrounded by the visceral peritoneum. All of the small intestine is surrounded by that visceral peritoneum. So you, you have um, this peritoneum that's kind of protecting this area, if you have an infection of that peritoneum, they call it peritonitis, right? And then that's a very serious, a very painful type of infection of that um, serous membrane. Now, some of the serous membrane um, is going to suspend the organs, because when we look in the abdominal cavity and this peritoneal cavity, everybody's organs are in the same place. The liver is on the right, the stomach's on the left, just below, just below the liver a little bit. Um, everything stays in the same place. You know, the, the colon is always in the same location, the small intestine. So some of this, um, this these tissues uh, are going to help to suspend the organs, right? So we have, um, if you look at the liver and then hanging down from the liver, you see this lesser omentum it's kind of suspending the stomach where it should be. And then coming down from the stomach, we have another um, layer of tissue called the greater omentum. So we have the lesser and the greater omentum. And we'll look at that uh, again when we look at the stomach, but the, um, the, the greater omentum looks like just this great big old apron that comes down. And it's a fatty apron. They call it like a fatty apron because it's full of adipose tissue. And so when a person gains abdominal weight, that's what they're going to do is they're going to expand the size of that um, the adipose tissue in the greater omentum. And the, the tissue there, the adipose tissue is very um, necessary. You know, it helps to protect a lot of the organs and helps to, um, 
you know, it helps to um, store nutrients, but it also produces neurotransmitters. So it's kind of an important, um, an important structure. And we'll see that a little bit later. We also see, when we look at this picture here, we can see some other, um, here's the lesser omentum. So the lesser omentum is suspending the stomach on the smaller side of the stomach, the smaller curve, which we call the lesser curvature. On the greater curvature, here you say the greater, you see the greater omentum. Both of them have been cut, but at least you can see where they're at. And they're just, um, you know, those are just some structures we have to know. Then there's some other structures in here that are called, this is a mesentery. And the mesentery, again, uh, it's, it's like part of that visceral peritoneum that helps to just keep out all of the um, colon in its proper um, location. Okay, so that you have the ascending transverse descending sigma, which is the colon, and then the um, small intestine where it's supposed to be. So, all right. Now, no matter where we look in this muscular <laughs> tube, we're going to see that the wall of the muscular tube has four basic layers to it. The inside layer is called the mucosa. Then, just a little more um, deeper than that, we have the submucosa. A little deeper than that, we have the muscular layer. And a little bit deeper than that, we have the serosa. And the serosa and the visceral peritoneum are the same thing. The serosa and the visceral peritoneum are the same thing. So we look at the mucosa, and what we're going to see, and this is going to be just slightly different in different areas, but um, on the mucosa, there are um, these, we'll see many, in different places, many different um, kind of rolls in there and circular folds in there. Uh, and, and we call those different things in different areas. And then on top of that, um, we'll have even more, um, you know, more folds on top of that. And all that's doing is increasing the surface area. So when we get to different areas, I'm going to point this out. Here's, a ch here's something unique in this area with the mucosa. Okay, so we'll just go through it and point that all out. Um, in the submucosa area, and I'm going to just make this picture a little bit bigger here. Okay, so here's just a bigger picture so you can see the mucosa. And here's that circular fold. Okay, and then on top of the circular fold, we have these villi, which you guys know as microvilli. They help to increase the surface area. And then right below that, we have the submucosal layer. And we can see all sorts of arteries and veins and lymphatics and nerves. And they're going to extend up into those microvilli. Um, into those circular folds. Underneath that, we have the muscular layer, and we'll see that in the muscular layer, there's two different um, layers of muscle, of smooth muscle. Uh, that's because it's this uh, muscle is going to help to do two things. Uh, it's going to help to churn that area so that you're mechanically breaking down the food or the substance. It's also going to propel the substance forward so that it's not coming back. It always wants to go towards the rectum, not towards the mouth, right? And that's called peristalsis. So we're going to see how those muscles help to propel things. And then finally, we have that serosa. And like I said, the serosa and the visceral peritoneum are the same thing. OK, so peristalsis. Peristalsis is a term you need to know. That means contractions of that smooth muscle that are propelling material from the mouth towards the anus, right? So towards the, the rectum. Um, to get that, there's, you can see here this, um, this brown thing here is a bolus of food. We call it a bolus, right? So you, in, you're, you ingest food and you chew it up and then you swallow it and it's going to go down into your esophagus. Then that muscular tube can squeeze behind that bolus and push that bolus forward, right? So we're going to see that in areas where there's more solid material, like in the esophagus, in the colon, we're going to get peristaltic 
contractions that will help to move these substances through. Right? In other areas where it's more liquid, we don't need as much peristaltic contractions. Like in the small intestine, it's pretty liquidy. So we're not going to have a lot of peristaltic contractions there. In the colon, they're going to be more solid. We're going to get peristaltic contractions there. There's an other areas where we get sort of a segmentation contraction. And that's where um, the layers will contract at different times and will cause a turning and kind of mechanically break up that bolus of food then. Uh, and, and we'll see that, how that, you know, your stomach churns. We get some contractions like that um, in that area. So we'll look at, um, well, we just have segmentation as well. We won't really look too much at that. But that's um, peristalsis. Now, another thing that's so unique about the digestive system is that they say the digestive system has a brain of its own because it has a little neural network going from, like, the intestines to the stomach. And so um, it's always communicating with each other. Um, the stomach always knows when it should be churning, when it should stop churning, okay? Um, the colon always knows when it should be giving big peristaltic contractions and when it shouldn't be, okay? So you, it kind of knows what to do. You don't have to tell it anything. It doesn't need the brain to tell it anything. So there are um, neural, uh, neural cor um, neurons um, throughout the digestive tract as well as hormones that are going to be released to tell the stomach when to um, release its contents, okay? When for the sphincter muscles to open up, um, when for the... Um, the colon to have huge peristaltic contractions. So there's, it just has a brain of its own. It has a neural system of its own that it works on without your brain having to tell it anything. Okay, so let's start with the mouth. This is where we're going to start. Uh, so in the mouth, uh, if we look at this, um, you have, first of all, the oral cavity. You have the lips, the upper and the lower lips, which on your lab list are called labium. So you have the labium of the oral cavity, right? So there's also labium of the reproductive um, tract, you know, of, of the female uh, anatomy. So we want to make sure that we say labium of the oral cavity, okay? And then inside the mouth, we have the teeth. We're going to look a little bit at the teeth. The tongue is a huge muscle that helps to move things around inside the mouth. Um, and then towards the back, uh, actually on the top, we have the hard palate. Behind the hard palate, we have the soft palate. And then the soft palate comes to the tip at the uvula, which hangs down at the back of your mouth. We also have um, the tonsils, which we talked about in the um, lymphatic system. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> let's take a look at the view from the anterior view. So now you're looking inside the mouth, and again, here's the labium of the oral cavity. Back here, you can see the tongue, or the uvula is hanging down. This is the soft palate. This is the hard palate. Uh, and then you can see these tonsils on either side that we had talked about in the lymphatic system. Let's see if I don't know if we can see this picture. Can you see that? Oh, you can't see that. Oh, that's too bad. All right, I'll try a different one. I've got my um, daughter's tonsils up. I wanted to show you guys that, but uh, I'll have to do that. I have to add it into the PowerPoint, otherwise you can't see it. So I'll have to show you that on a different day. Okay. All right, so let's look at the teeth. Now, first we're going to go over the individual tooth. Um, this is going to be a picture on your lab exam, so you have to know the structures on here. The tooth itself can be divided up into three different sections. Anything above the gums, that's called the crown. Right at the gums, that's called the neck. Anything below the neck, that's called the root. Okay, so we've got the three sections of the tooth. Let's start by looking at the crown. The crown is covered by a really hard white substance that's called enamel, enamel. And um, it's very, very hard. It's like bone, really hard. 
And right underneath that bone, right underneath the enamel, is another bone-like substance, but it's really porous, much more porous. I'm not asking if I love the spongy bone, the compact bone. Well, here we have enamel and we have dentin. So we've got a good amount of dentin up there in the crown too. And then inside that dentin is a cavity in there that we call the pulp cavity. And the pulp cavity we can see is filled with the endings of nerves and also with um, where the arteries and veins and all those capillaries are going to be. Right? So then we get to the, the, the neck of the tooth, and that's where the gums are, and the gums we call gingiva. And so um, we can see how the, the gums kind of come down. The, also in the neck area, the enamel is going to come down, too, towards the end of the neck. So it's still, it's thinning out a little bit, but it's still protecting that dentin, right? So when um, you have receding gums, of course, they start to recede down and they get thinner, then all of a sudden now you have less protection over that dentin. And the dentin is really porous, so once you get to that, then cavities can even easily form. Cavities are bacteria that eat away at this um, substance. They eat away at the enamel, they eat away at the dentin, okay? Um, and they form poles. So that's the, that's the neck then. And then below the neck, we have the root, right? So in the root, we can see that there's no more enamel. There's no enamel covering the tooth. Instead, we have um, a thin lining of cementum of course, they changed it now to cement, but it's a cementum is the name of it that you'll see in your lab, uh, in your lecture notes. And then attaching to the cementum is a ligament that's called the periodontal ligament. And the periodontal ligament is going to hold that cementum tightly onto your bone, so onto the maxilla or onto the mandible, so that your tooth does not move. It should not be loose. It should be down in that root area really tight, and it should not be loose at all. And then underneath the cementum, we have that dentin, okay? And then inside the dentin, we have the root canal, the root canal. So on teeth like the molars, there's going to be two root canals because those are the, they're, they're broader, they're bigger in the back, but in the front where you only have, you know, it's a much thinner tooth, you're only gonna have one root canal. So in the root canal, though, this is where the arteries and veins and nerves come up, and then they um, expand into that uh, pulp cavity area. Okay. All right, so that is the typical tooth. Now we're going to look at all the different teeth. This is another diagram that will probably be on your lab exam. Um, it shows the different types of teeth that we have. Right here, these are the teeth in the front of the mouth. And then going this way, these are the teeth in the back of the mouth. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on these teeth, but those of you going into dental hygiene, when you get in there, you will be hand sketching and drawing every single tooth in the, in the mouth. All 32 adult teeth, you will be sketching every little shade, every little nook and cranny. You will know them um, very intimately. All right. So we're just going to go over in general. Um, in the front of the mouth, you have these incisors. They come down like, um, like a blade, like a, like a knife would, okay? So they are more of a blade. Um, and then right behind that, if we just start going backwards, then we can see that there are these canines, and another name for a canine is a cuspid. And they come to more of a sharper point, right? So those are the canines of the cuspid. And if we move back just a little bit further, then we get to the premolars, which are also called bicuspid. So we see that the that sharp point starts to broaden out a little bit. So we're starting to get a little bit more of a flat surface. It's a little bit broader, but it's still a little bit um, pointy there. <coughs> and then finally, we get to the molars, and the molars have a very flat surface. And that surface we call the occlusal surface. An occlusal surface is where two teeth come together, where the two flat surfaces come together. So the molars have a really broad, um, you know, occlusal surface. So um, molars are going to be more for the grinding and, you know, the grinding of food, the chewing of food, whereas the incisors that are more like blades, they're going to be more for like the, the tearing of food. 
Okay, so they kind of all have their own separate functions. So when you're born, though, of course, most babies are not born with teeth. You know, it's not, they have, there have been cases where there are babies born with some teeth, but most babies are not born with teeth, and then the teeth have to come in. And when the teeth come in, they're the baby teeth. Um, the baby teeth are also called deciduous teeth or primary teeth. Okay, a deciduous tree is a tree where the leaves fall off and then it grows back again in the spring. So the deciduous teeth are going to fall out. They're not the permanent teeth. Okay, and um, the deciduous teeth, there's going to be fewer of those. There's 20, 20 primary teeth versus the permanent teeth, the secondary teeth. There's going to be 32. Okay, so the first thing, that they'll come in not all at once. They come in a little at a time. For us, you do not have to memorize when exactly they come in, all right? But the bottom two teeth, the bottom central incisors are going to come in first, and we see that happening in an infant usually around six months of age. Maybe they don't come in until eight months of age. That doesn't mean anything. It's still normal, all right? But six months is the average of when those two come in, and then we're going to get the lateral incisors on the sides of those coming in, and then the top teeth top central incisors come in and then the lateral incisors come in. So what happens in the baby is they start getting irritated gums and they start to salivate a lot um, to try to wash any bacteria away from this, this mucosa that's starting to split open so the tooth can come through. And then after that, um, around 12, at about a year, um, they're going to get their um, molars, their first molars coming in, and then a year and a half. Um, they're going to get, uh, well, uh, in about 14 months, they're going to get the molars on the top coming in. Um, and then um, at 24 months, um, all the teeth, at two years, all the baby teeth should be in. So it starts at six months. By the time they're two years old, all the baby teeth should be in. The canines, the sharp ones there, those are the ones that tend to cause them a lot of pain. Um, but all of them are, all of them make them fussy for sure. Um, then, then they start to fall out. And so what happens is, you know, they're, th these teeth are forming in the actual bone, right? In the mandible, in the maxilla. And so here you can actually see, um, here's the, the deciduous teeth that are, have already erupted, but then here are the underlying um, permanent teeth that are forming in the jaw itself, right? So they form in the jaw, they have to work their way out through that bone and then work their way out through that mucosa. So we can kind of see the permanent teeth under the deciduous teeth. So here's um, what the permanent teeth look like, and they're going to start to come in at different times too. So the baby teeth are not going to all fall out at once. They fall out, you know, a little at a time as the permanent teeth are coming in, and we're going to go in the same order. So on the bottom, we're going to get those incisors falling out and then coming in. And then on the top, and that starts at about six or seven years of age, right? And then, you know, at seven or eight, then we get the top teeth falling out. You know, all I want for Christmas are my two front teeth. Well, that's going to be like a first grader. You know, first grader is going to have their teeth, they're going to have gaps as the deciduous teeth fall out and the permanent ones come in. And then we're going to keep working our way back. You know, the, um, we're going to get the canines coming in. On the top, on the bottom, then the top, then the premolars on the bottom, then the top, and then the molars on the bottom and on the top. And like I said, there's going to be 32 teeth that are permanent versus the 20 teeth that were in the babies uh, in the infant. And um, we see here that there's going to be a third molar, okay? And we also have those premolars, but there's going to be a third molar, and that erupts around 17 to 21 years of age, and those are called your wisdom teeth, right? And sometimes um, the dentists get worried about those because they come in at an awkward angle and they can cause problems and they can cause crowding in the teeth and then they might want to remove those um, so that we don't have that happen. All right, so that's the teeth. And, and mainly the teeth, the job of the teeth is to make sure that it's chewing things small enough so that the, the bolus of food can enter into the esophagus. Yes, Ali.
Um, well, it's something that should probably get looked at, but um, their baby teeth will fall out at some point. But I, I don't know. Do you know of a certain, do you know of someone that has baby teeth still in their teenage years? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's all sorts of things that'll happen. Some people don't develop their permanent teeth in certain areas. Um, it, you know, I, I would have to, I don't know that certain case. Maybe they never had a deciduous tooth. Maybe that is their permanent tooth. You know, so it, you'd have to have that looked at. But, um, you know, um, the main thing is, you know, you want to try to keep these choppers for your whole life. So um, that's, that's the, you know, the biggest key, I guess. So it would be looking at it and saying, are these going to be baby teeth that are going to fall out? Or are they going to, you know, be the permanent teeth then and stay for the rest of the life? So you have, like, um, the first molar second molar yeah uh, used to have like just one and then you yeah. become two yeah yep okay. yep that's where it right so there's only 20 teeth so then you only have um the no premolars really the two molars and then you end up with premolars so you have more teeth in, you have more time to mm -hmm. form those and yeah so um <laughs> You know, we did talk about, too, in um, the teeth, for some reason, they have an affinity towards, they're a tissue that has an affinity towards certain um, substances, like certain medications um, will um, be absorbed into the tooth area. They just, that's a tissue that has an affinity for that. There's, and so, like, uh, drugs like um, tetracycline, right? If tetracycline is given... Um, before the teeth erupt, then the teeth might end up with a yellow discoloration just because it has an affinity toward the towards the tooth. Or, as a, or if a mom takes tetracycline when she's pregnant, right, um, and the baby receives that tetracycline, then um, the same thing, that tetracycline might have an affinity for those developing teeth. Okay? So that's just something to always keep in mind. Okay, then, all right, so past the, the teeth, the teeth are chewing and grinding and getting that bolus of food small enough so that you can swallow it. Then we also have these glands that are called the salivary glands. We have the parotid salivary gland, the sublingual salivary gland, and the submandibular salivary gland. So yes, on the lab exam, please put the word salivary in there, all right? It's on the lab list, so put it in there. Um, okay. So what these glands do, they secrete a lot of fluid, a lot of water, so they're helping to make that substance in your mouth um, easier to swallow, okay? But they also secrete a substance called amylase. Amylase. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates. Anytime you see a, a chemical that has A-S-E at the end of it, it's an enzyme. Okay, so amylase is breaking carbohydrates down into glucose. So where does carbohydrate digestion begin? In the mouth, okay? Protein digestion does not begin there. There's a little bit of lipid, uh, there's a little bit of lipase, that's an enzyme um, that's secreted in the salivary juice, right, salivary um, saliva. Um, but not much. So primarily we say that the carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth because of the salivary amylase. So we'll hear about amylase again, but it, at least in the mouth, it's salivary amylase because it's coming from the, the salivary glands. All right, now the pH in the mouth is at about 4.5 at this point. So it's kind of acidic in the mouth, right? You know your blood pH? 7.35 to 7.45. That's the pH of the blood. So in the mouth, um, the pH is going to get more acidic and drop down to about 7.4. And so then, um, okay, so here you have this bolus of food in your mouth. Your teeth have already chewed it. It's got salivary amylase in it, starting to break down the carbohydrates. Your tongue is going to push that fluid when, or that bolus of food, when you swallow, it's going to push it down, and it's going to, you see that, that blotted right there? There's the trachea, there's this 
this narrow little slit right there, which is your esophagus, <coughs> okay? And that bolus of food, when you swallow it, the tongue and those muscles are going to push it downward, and it is going to close that epiglottis. So it closes the epiglottis so the food cannot go down the trachea. It's not going to go down that front tube. Instead, it's going to open up that back tube, which is called the esophagus. And now the food is going down the esophagus. All right. So the food is in the esophagus, and um, the salivary amylase is still working. Right? The salivary amylase is still in there, still working, trying to break down the carbohydrate, but um, nothing in the esophagus is going to get absorbed. Nothing gets absorbed there. Okay. Nothing gets secreted into the esophagus to help with any other digestion. Right? So you're not having any other enzymes being secreted into the tube. The only thing that's really happening here in the esophagus is that the salivary amylase keeps working and there are peristaltic contractions pushing that bolus of food down towards the stomach. Okay, that's about it. It's just tube to get it down to the stomach. When we talked about the mouth and we looked at absorption in the mouth, not a ton of things get absorbed in the mouth either. Right? Some things do. Like what do we put under the tongue in a person that's having um, an angina, right? Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin gets absorbed under the tongue. Vitamin B12 can get absorbed under the, you know, in the mouth. Um, there's certain certain chemicals that can get absorbed in the mouth, but it's not a primary area for absorption. And then once we get to the esophagus, nothing gets absorbed there. Nothing's going to get absorbed there, right? And then we get all the way down to the end of the esophagus, and that food, that bolus, has to go through a lower esophageal sphincter, right? Lower esophageal sphincter. So, um, and then the bolus of food goes into the stomach. Now, if something damages that lower esophageal sphincter, okay, like GERD or reflux disease, right, then the contents of the stomach will start to go back up into the esophagus and maybe cause cancer on that sensitive tissue or cause heartburn, you know. So, you need to keep that lower esophageal sphincter pretty intact. All right, now that bolus of food is in the stomach. So let's look at the stomach and see what happens there. Here's the stomach. Stomach sits off to the left side, high in the abdominal cavity, in that peritoneal cavity. So here's the esophagus right up here, and it leads into the stomach. The stomach has different areas to it. The esophagus leads into this first area, which is called the cardia. Cardia. And then there's kind of a bulge on top that's called the fundus. Then the most of the large part of the stomach is called the body of the stomach. And then we have where it narrows down, that's called the pylorus. And then at the end of the pylorus is the pyloric sphincter. And the sphincter is a circular muscle that when it's contracted, it's closed. When it relaxes, it's open. So the bolus of food gets into the stomach. Now inside the stomach, you see these big folds in there, these big circular folds that are called rugae. They're big and rugged, so we call them rugae. Okay, that's what those circular folds are called in there. Where on the top, where there's a smaller curve, that's the lesser curvature. That was where the lesser omentum was attached. On the other side, there's the greater curvature. That's where that greater omentum, the fatty apron, is attached. Okay, this is what the inside of the stomach looks like then, right? So we've got, here's your big rugae, your big circular folds, and then you're seeing the cells then that line those indentations. So they're lining the indentations. I'm going to blow that up, show you the next picture where we can see that a little bit bigger. Okay, so here we see it a little bit bigger, right? Um, these are the indentations in between those, those big rugged rugae. And the first part, the more superficial part of that indentation is called the gastric pit. The gastric pit. The gastric pit is lined by mucosal cells. These mucus cells, these mucosal cells secrete mucus. Mucus is slippery and slimy, and it ends up coating the entire surface inside the stomach. 
That makes it difficult for anything to be absorbed in the stomach. Some things are, aspirin is, aspirin can be, it's a really acidic environment. So things like aspirin are gonna be able to be absorbed in the stomach, okay? Um, but it, it's doing that, the reason why these mucosal cells are secreting the mucus is because acid is gonna be secreted in the stomach as well. And if, those, if the lining is um, exposed to the acid, it'll burn a hole in the stomach lining. So we've got the mucus to protect the stomach lining. Now we look below the gastric pit and we see the gastric glands. So the mucus cells stop and now these other cells are gonna line that gastric gland, okay? Um, two types of cells, well there's three types, two types that we're gonna talk about right now. We have the parietal cells and we have the chief cells in between them. So the um, parietal cells. The parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. Now, HCL has a pH of 1, right? HCL is extremely acidic. It's a strong acid. So that's why we have the mucus, because the hydrochloric acid, as it's produced and it goes up into the stomach, it could easily burn a hole through the stomach wall. So we've got the mucus to protect it, okay? So the hydrochloric acid, um, it's, it, it's going to help to start tearing down, uh, well, first of all, it lowers the pH to about 1.5 to 2.0. Know, the content coming in was about 4.5, and now it mixes with the hydrochloric acid, and so then the pH drops to about 1.5 to 2. And now the salivary amylase stops working. It's too acidic, and the salivary amylase stops. Okay, so we no longer have carbohydrate digestion going on. Doesn't mean that all the carbohydrates have been digested, it just means that for now, Carbohydrate digestion stops, okay? All right, so the hydrochloric acid, though, is pretty acidic, and it can start to tear down some of the proteins, right? So HCL, um, pretty strong. It can start to tear down some of the proteins, and in addition to that, um, these uh, chief cells, they release a substance called pepsinogen. Peps. Pepsin, pepsin, oh gin, pepsinogen. And HCL will cause pepsinogen to convert to pepsin. And pepsin breaks down polypeptides into amino acids. <coughs> so we need that hydrochloric acid to convert that pepsinogen into pepsin. Okay? So now we've got the beginning of protein digestion. So where does protein digestion begin? In the stomach. Right, where it's nice and acidic, okay? Um, all right, so chief cells secrete the pepsinogen, parietal cells secrete HCL, parietal cells also secrete uh, a substance called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor binds to vitamin B12, okay? So you have to have vitamin B12 bound to intrinsic factor in order to absorb it. So you have to have that so that when you get to the small intestine, B12 can get absorbed. If you don't have enough B12, you end up with an anemia. Do you guys know what type of anemia that is? It's called pernicious anemia, right? If you, have, if you don't have enough vitamin B12. So we have to have that intrinsic factor from the parietal cells. All right, so that's our stomach then. So what happens with all the secretions from the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin, and we're breaking down proteins, Proteins are big and chunky, so now we're actually breaking this down into, it's almost like a liquid. It's very liquidy now, very watery, and now we're not going to call it a bolus of food anymore. Now we're going to call it chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. So the substance inside the stomach is now called chyme, and it has a pH of about you know 1.5 to 2.0, and that's really good for um, that pepsinogen, right? When it gets to be that low, when the, when the, um, let's see, where's a good picture here? Let's see another picture. Too. 
All right, so when the substance gets um, liquidy enough and the pH drops enough, then that pyloric sphincter is going to open up. All right, so we've got all this stuff, HDL, pepsin, everything breaks down the protein, making it really liquid into time. When the pH drops low enough and it gets liquidy enough, that's going to trigger this pyloric sphincter to relax. So it opens up, and the chyme then moves into the small intestine. Right? And now we're in the small intestine, um, and, and the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. So we're going to go through the small intestine, then we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to go through the rest of this, all right? just so you guys know. All right, so now we're into the small intestine. We're into the duodenum. I'm going to go show you what small intestine looks like. There we go. Here's the small intestine. So the first part is the duodenum. That's the blue part. That's kind of small, kind of short. It's about 10 inches. And then we get into this purple area here. That's called the jejunum. Okay, that's a little bit longer. That's about 8 feet or so. And then we get into the last part of the small intestine, and that's called the ileum. So we have the, du the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Okay? And each one has a different um, function. So they're all a little bit different. The duodenum, which sits up here, uh, it's going to have some other organs secreting substances into it. And those are accessory structures. Oh. So, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so I, sorry, I have my, I have my um, vibration on but I also bypass it if my kids call me so that it rings. So <laughs> I'm sure you guys do something like that too, right? <laughs> so, all right, so sorry about that. So anyway, um, the duodenum, there's the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas are accessory organs that are going to secrete substances into the duodenum. And we're going to go over those three accessory organs after our break, all right? So they're secreting substances into the duodenum and that's mixing with the chyme. And it's bringing the pH back up a little bit. It's bringing it back up to 4, 4.5, right? So, um, and it's called the mixing bowl. It's so short. There's not a lot. Substances are going to pass through it pretty quickly. The duodenum is only like 10 inches, so it's passing through a, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and it, um, so there's not a lot of time for anything to get absorbed through the cells lining that um, small intestine. So we call it the mixing bowl, though, because it's mixing the chyme with the secretions from the pancreas, with the secretions from the liver, and with the secretions from the gallbladder. It's mixing all of that together, so we call it the mixing bowl. All right, and then after break, we will talk about um, the pancreas secretions and the, and the gallbladder and the liver. Then this, um, this mixture then moves into the jejunum, which is the second part, and then that's long. That's like eight feet long. So now we have a lot of time where things can get absorbed through the intestinal lining and then through the blood vessel lining to get into the blood. And again, it's not absorbed until it's into the blood. That's when it gets absorbed. That's when we say it's absorbed, right? So, all right, so the jejunum, we could say then, this is the area that where most of the nutrients are absorbed and where most of the water is absorbed. Okay, so that's the that's just one of the, the jejunum. It's long enough. It has the first shot at all of these things. That's where absor absor absorption is going to occur. So if you have an inflammation inside the jejunum, or if you have sores or things like that inside the jejunum, you're not going to have good absorption right there, right? And you'll end up with a malabsorption uh, disease or disorder. So we have to have um, a really good <coughs> jejunum. So things, you know, like um, ulcerative colitis, um, you know, there's Crohn's disease, um, some different types of diseases like that, that you're getting inflammation of the mucosa on the inside of the jejunum. You're not getting great absorption then, right? You're not absorbing things. All right, well, um, then from the jejunum, it's going to just move into this last part, which is called the ileum. The structure is a little bit different, but not much. And so we're going to continue to get absorption. 
Um, so absorption of nutrients, absorption of water. All right, now let me just show you what the jejunum looks like on the inside. So this is on the inside of the jejunum. We have these huge folds. So all that liquid, just think about it, has to go in and out of all of these folds in it, right? This tissue can be pretty delicate. So it, you know, it can get inflamed um, and irritated by certain, you know, things if you have a sensitivity to like gluten and things like that, right? Um, this is showing the layers of the jejunum. I just want to show you this. It's, this is an important point. Again, we have the mucosa, submucosa, muscular, serosal um, layers. And if we look at, okay, so we're looking at the layers here. The top layer is the, mu the mucosa. And we can see that there are these projections there that we call the villi. So remember, we talked about how the cells um, that are in the intestinal area are going to be, um, they're going to be columnar, and they're going to have, they're going to have villi on them. Do you remember what the microvilli did? Increased surface area. Increased surface area, so you have more surface area in order to absorb nutrients. Let's take a look at one of those microvilli. So here's one of the villi. Um, we can see that it's lined by all of these cells. Um, some of the cells on the bottom we call brush border cells, and they're going to secrete some more substances that will help with the breakdown of some of these chemicals. But the important thing that we want to look at are the blood vessels and the lymphatics. So the, the green are the lymphatic vessels, um, and then we've got the arteries and veins, and here's all the capillaries. We can see they extend up into those microvilli. So when we are absorbing nutrients, the nutrients have to get absorbed through the cells lining the villi and then through the cells lining the blood vessel, right? The polysaccharides, so the amino acids uh, and the glucose, the glucose and the amino acids, they are going to get absorbed into the blood, okay? They're going to get absorbed into the blood. So they go through the cells, through the blood vessels, now they're into the blood. All of those capillaries are going to converge into these two arteries, the superior mesenteric vein and the inferior mesenteric vein. Remember hearing about those? Remember we talked about those? Mm -hmm. Now those mesenteric veins are just a portal system. They don't go into the general circulation. They're blood vessels that go right from the intestines to the liver. Okay. So when you are absorbing glucose and amino acids, that's going to go directly to the liver, and then the liver gets first shot at those. The liver will decide what to do with those. When we're done with break, I'm going to tell you what the, all the roles of the liver are. But one of the roles of the liver is that it's going to receive that glucose and the amino acids first, and it gets to decide what to do with it. If it wants to put those, those out into circulation through the hepatic vein, it'll send it into the inferior vein. All right, now, lipids. The larger lipids, they're not going to be able to get into those blood vessels because they're too big. Instead, they're going to move into the lymphatic vessels. Okay? And we said the lymphatic vessels, how did the lymphatic vessels get to the blood? Well, okay, so they're, so, but the, we've already gone past that, right? So the lipids are already into the lymphatic vessels. Those lymphatic vessels are going to merge into two main lymphatic vessels. What are they? The thoracic duct and right lymphatic duct, right? And then where do they dump into? Subclavian veins, right? Then they're absorbed. Then the lipids are absorbed. So they're not going to go through the liver. They're just going to go back and get dumped into the subclavian veins. Now they're absorbed. Now we've absorbed them into the body. Now they can be delivered wherever. Are they going to be delivered to fat cells to be stored? Are they going to be delivered to tissues to be used for energy? Right? So that's an important point. The lipids are going to be um, absorbed into the lymphatics and then into the blood directly. 
And then the um, glucose and amino acids, they're going to get absorbed into the blood, but go straight to the liver before they go out into your general circulation. Okay, so that's where we're going to take a break. Current. Oh, there isn't? Okay. They took it off then. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, huh. interesting. All right. So, um, you know, before I take a look at those accessory structures, let me tell you a couple of hormones that are released. Um, from the mucosal cells of the duodenum. You know, so all the mucosal cells that line the duodenum, they're secreting mucus and fluid, um, but there's also some hormones that get secreted from the intestinal mucosa at different times. So this one, um, this one hormone is called gastrin. Gastrin. Gastrin sounds like gastric. Gastric means stomach, okay? So when gastrin gets secreted, um, it's going to actually cause the stomach to increase its motility, to start squeezing. So when food hits the duodenum, it's through the stomach, um, it's starting to hit the duodenum, the um, duodenum is going to release this um, gastrin and make the stomach really start churning and breaking up the substances even faster. Um, there's another substance that's um, another hormone called secretin that's going to be released. Secretin sounds like secrete. Secretin sounds like secrete. So whenever the chyme arrives in the duodenum, the duodenum cells, the duodenal cells will start releasing secretin. Secretin is going to target the pancreas and the liver. And it's going to make the pancreas and the liver secrete. Okay, and they're going to secrete digestive things. So secretin makes the pancreas and the liver secrete. Right? <coughs> then we have this other one here called CCK or cholecystine kinase. When um, when substances, especially fat, arrive in the duodenum, CCK is released. CCK is going to target the gallbladder and make the gallbladder squeeze. And then the substances from the gallbladder will move into the duodenum. So when the gallbladder isn't working and they want to see if the gallbladder is working, they will maybe um, have some dye put into the, the gallbladder and then they'll give the patient CCK that will make the gallbladder squeeze and they'll look through an ultrasound making sure that the, the, um, the bile, which is in there, the substance, moves out of the, the gallbladder and into the, um, into the duodenum. If it's not doing that, then, okay, the, the gallbladder's not working very well, all right? So they have to remove it, or they have to do something about that. So we've got CCK. And then the last one that you need to know is called the gastric inhibitory peptide. Gastric inhibitory peptide. And this is when, um, you know, fats and carbohydrates pump into the duodenum, then... Um, the gastric inhibitory peptide will kind of slow down the stomach from churning. Okay. Um, it'll stimulate the glands in the small intestine to start secreting. Um, so it, it has a couple of different functions that I know it's in your lecture notes, um, but we're not going to go too, um, too much into the gastric inhibitory peptide. It has to, I mean, the main thing that it does, it sounds like gastric inhibitory. So it, it, it's going to inhibit the stomach, and at the same time, it's going to increase the pancreas releasing insulin. Right? That's mainly what it does. So if you can kind of just think of it that way, gastric inhibitory. So gastrin causes the stomach to increase motility, and then gastric inhibitory is going to say, okay, now stomach, stop doing all that churning so that the pancreas can release the insulin, right? So 
All right, so we've got those hormones, those ones you have to know about. Now we're going to talk about those accessory structures that deposit substances into the duodenum. <clears throat> we're going to start by looking at the pancreas. Okay, so the pan here's the duodenum. The pancreas sits right in that curve. This is the pancreas right here. The pancreas has a huge duct running down the center of it. Now the majority of this pancreas's job is to release digestive enzymes. A very small portion of its job, um, which is vital to your health, is to release insulin and glucagon. The majority of it, like 99% of its job, is to be an exocrine organ or to release digestive enzymes. So when it's secreting these digestive enzymes, they're going to go into the duct. And then you can see how the ducts, the two ducts here, uh, coming from the pancreas, they open up into the duodenum. All right. So what is the, in this pancreatic secretion? The pancreatic secretion is called pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice. Okay. It's got a lot of bicarbonate in it. Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is alkaline, right? And it's going to make that acidic kind that just came from the stomach, that one, pH of 1.5 to 2.0. It's going to mix with that bicarbonate. <coughs> it's going to bring that pH back up again. So that doesn't um, damage the intestinal lining. So it's got bicarbonate. It also has um, enzymes that can digest all four of the organic molecules. So it has amylase. So in this case, we would call it pancreatic amylase. That's going to break down the carbohydrates into glucose. It has protease. Protease, it's going to, it has pancreatic protease. Protease breaks down proteins into amino acids, right? So protein digestion continues here. Then we have lipase, but this time it's called, instead of salivary lipase, it's now pancreatic lipase. And then we have another one that's called nuclease. And if you remember, our fourth organic molecule are nucleic acids. So nuclease will break down nucleic acids into nucleotides. Not, you know, not as important as looking at our three main organic molecules that we eat, right? So the pancreas, that's what it does. It secretes enzymes that are going to digest every, you know, all three of our organic molecules, and it secretes a bicarbonate, which is going to help to make that substance more, um, more uh, basic, more alkaline. So we got a lot of digestion going on now from that pancreatic secretion. Now the next organ that we come to is the liver. The liver has, um, it's a large, large organ. And it sits off to the right side, but it takes up a good amount of that right side, um, that, that upper right quadrant. And some of it comes over to the left side. On the right side, we have the large right lobe over towards the center of the peritoneal cavity. Um, we have the left lobe moving into the left upper quadrant. Okay, so we've got that. On the other side, if we look at the posterior surface, we can see there's two more smaller lobes. We have the caudate lobe and we have the quadrate lobe. Okay. Um, all right, so now um, the liver has a big function to it. And first, I'm going to kind of move a little bit bigger here. OK. Um, that other organ, that gallbladder, that, that's that green organ right here, it's going to receive some of the substances from the liver. So one of the main jobs of the liver is to make bile, right? Bile, B-I-L-E. And that bile is going to move through this hepatic duct and move up through the cystic duct, and it's going to be stored in the gallbladder. And then it's going to be modified in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder modifies and stores bile. And then as soon as that fat hits the duodenum and CCK gets released, that gallbladder is going to squeeze, and that, sub, that bile then is going to move into through the cystic duct again, through the bile duct, and then get into the duodenum. So we keep hearing from the surgical tech program that students don't know these ducts well enough. There's a lot of gallbladder surgeries, removals out there, right? So you have to know the names of the, the ducts. We have the common hepatic duct coming from the liver. Hepatic means liver. 
the common cystic duct coming from the gallbladder, and they merge together to form the bile duct. Okay? You've got the hepatic duct, the cystic duct, and then the bile duct. Right? If you want to know those. So um, what does bile do? Bile helps to emulsify fats. Right? Emulsify. So what does that mean? That means you've got big fat droplets. And we have to, in order for our lipase to work, we need to get the fat droplets, the big fat molecules, smaller. So bile breaks them down into smaller fat molecules, and then lipase breaks them down into the triglycerides. So we kind of have this two-step process. So um, that's what bile helps to do. When they remove the gallbladder, the liver is still producing bile. The liver is still going to secrete the bile into the, into the small intestine, right? So you're getting still some bile in there. But um, the, this holds a, a, an amount that can be squeezed out quickly, right? Quickly when the food hits your um, duodenum. So, you know, people that don't have gallbladders, they have to make sure that they're eating a low-fat diet. Otherwise, that slippery fat, which isn't going to get broken down, might cause diarrhea because everything's going to slide right through, right? You're not going to be able to um, digest it as well, and it's not going to be absorbed as well. Okay, so they end up with some absorption issues too. All right, so, but that's not the only job of our liver. Liver is very important. Um, if we look at the cells inside the liver, the cells in the liver are called hepatocytes. And so each one of these things are cells, and they're lined the way they are arranged. They look like they're arranged like the spokes of a wheel. And in between them are all of these veins, right? So there's a lot of veins. Um, so we have a lot of the nutrients from the, the jejunum are coming through the superior and inferior mesenteric veins, where they combine to become the hepatic <laughs> portal vein, and now um, they're being spread throughout <coughs> the entire liver, through all these different veins, okay? And so the hepatic cells have to um, deal with <coughs> whatever is inside those veins. So you've absorbed some stuff, right, in the veins. You've absorbed glucose, and you've absorbed amino acid, and now they're at the liver. The hepatocytes have to decide, make a decision, what do I do with the glucose? Do I store the glucose as glycogen, because that's what stored glucose is, or do I release the glucose out into the general circulation? If it releases it into the general circulation, <coughs> it'll travel from the hepatic vein into the inferior renal cava. If it's going to be stored as glycogen, it's going to be stored as glycogen inside the hepatocytes. Right? So the, the liver has to decide that. What is it going to do with the amino acids? You know? Um, the liver, one of the things it makes are plasma proteins, right? It makes, like, the majority of the plasma proteins are made in the liver. So it's receiving all these amino acids. It's got to think, okay, do I need to make albumins? Do I need to make antibodies? Do I need to make fibrinogen? You know, I've got to make these plasma proteins. Do I do, I do that, you know? Do I do that? Do I make um, those proteins out of these amino acids? Okay, so um, that's another job that the liver, the hepatocytes have to do. They have to decide, do I make these plasma proteins? Okay. And then um, the liver cells are also receiving other things from what you ingest, like drugs if you're taking them orally, medications. You know, if you're taking medications orally, it first has to go to the liver. We call that first pass. It's going to go to the liver before it goes out into the general circulation. And what the hepatocytes are going to do is break that down. It's going to metabolize those toxins, metabolize those drugs, and in the majority of cases, it's going to make those not functional so that they can't do their normal job. Okay? So we adjust dosages of drugs because of this. Not all the drugs are going to get broken down, but a good majority of them are, and we can predict how many get broken down and how many will continue on without getting broken down into the general circulation. So if we had a person that had liver disease, what do you think you would adjust the dosage of the drug? Would you give them more of the drug or less of the drug? You'd give them less of the drug. They'd have to have a lower dose, right? 
because the liver is, if it's diseased, those hepatocytes are not breaking that drug down. It's going to actually have a higher, um, more um, of the drug gets into the bloodstream without being broken down further. Right. So the hepatocytes, huge. They just they have a, a really huge responsibility. <coughs> That's why we cannot live without the liver. The liver doesn't have to be there. It's going to break down, um, you know, jaundice. Um, one of the things that the liver does is it's going to, um, when, when the macrophages break down dead, you know, old red blood cells into biliverdin, then the liver is going to help to excrete that biliverdin um, into the feces. Biliverdin has like a yellowish tint to it. In liver disease, it's not functioning properly. You're not able to excrete that um, biliverdin into the um, feces, okay? So it's going to build up in the blood and make people's skin and eyes look real yellow. The other thing it's going to do is make the feces look real gray and not have that darkish tint that we should have. Okay? So, um, you know, the liver is very, very important. Now, um, when, it, when the liver uh, produces bile, because these hepatocytes are making bile, the bile is going to move into those ducts and then the ducts converge into the hepatic duct, move through the cystic duct, and into the gallbladder to be stored and modified. Okay. How about alcohol? How about alcohol? Alcohol, how does it damage the, alcohol can damage the, the liver for sure. Um, what, any specific questions? Um, how? liver has to break it down, that's yeah. why it's supposed to like, get higher liver? Um, it just, um, I don't know the exact mechanism, it just, it damages, it damages the liver, causes, it can cause cirrhosis of the liver, which is more of a hardening, and so then the cells can't function properly that way. It can cause like a fatty liver, um, again, we just have a lot more fat surrounding the liver, and it's not going to function properly that way. The exact mechanism I'm not sure of. Okay, then now, so now we have um, that all those, um, the, the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas all secreted into the duodenum, gets into the jejunum, that's where the majority of water reabsorption takes place, that's where the majority of nutrient absorption takes place, and now we get down um, to the ileum, and that, that substance now is getting more and more solid because we're reabsorbing water back into the um, body. Okay, so we're, we're absorbing, not reabsorbing, but we're absorbing anything that we drink that has fluid in it, we're absorbing that into the body. So it's getting a little bit sludgier, right? It's sludgy. And it's going to move into the large intestine through that ileocecal valve. So as soon as the ileocecal valve, there's pressure on that lower ileum, the ileocecal valve will relax, and that sludge will move into the large intestine. The first part of the large intestine here is the cecum. Okay, so in the end of the cecum, the cecum is just like a pouch at the beginning of the um, large intestine or the colon. And on the end of the pouch is the appendix, right? Now the appendix, um, we believe, used to be part of the cecum. We think that the cecum used to be this big, and then through ab uh, evolution, it just kind of shriveled up because it wasn't being used as much. Right? Now, there used to be what we believe are a lot of digestive enzymes in there that would digest hardy plant materials like roots and bark and tough leaves and things like that, which we don't need anymore. Right? We don't need a, a ton of that anymore. So through evolution, we believe that it just shriveled up a little bit and became the appendix. Okay? So um, they say that it's a, um, not so necessary. Uh, and if that gets inflamed, then they have to take that out, you know, because it's inflamed to affect it. So now the sludge is in the cecum, and the cecum is going to move up into this colon, into the, large, the rest of the large intestine. The thing with the large intestine is it has those two layers of smooth muscle surrounding it, but it also has this long muscle here called the tinea coli that goes all along um, the length of it. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, in sweatpants when you put that, that um, shoe string through there, right? You're putting it through there and it all bunches up. You know, you're trying to get it through and it's bunching up. That's, uh, oh, we are over time, aren't we? 
Oh, goodness. Let me finish up here, and then we'll finish with the urinary system. I know you guys have to get going. Let me just finish this thing until I... Um, that is just um, going to create these house drugs. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so I'll have to finish this, and it's okay because we have time. I will finish this up the next time we meet. So sorry for going over. Somebody needs to say, hey.